Hello, everyone. Welcome to Wind Down Friday. Today, our guests are Rob Rhodes and Dennis Riccio, co-founders of Extrinsic. Hi, guys. How are you? Very good. Hello, Riccio. Good Doing to see you. Well. So, where are you located, first of all, Rob? Uh, I'm in Indiana, USA. And you, Dennis? I'm in Payson, Arizona, just north of Phoenix, so uh, the big metropolis and semiconductor mecca. Good. So tell me, are you Italian? Because your last name is uh, typical Italian. Yeah, very much 100% Italian, uh, half Napolitan, half Calabrese, the kitchen of Italy, and uh, pronounced my name Riccio after many years of calling myself Riccio. So uh, absolutely 100% Italian. Good. So, um, you guys uh, uh, are co-founder of Extrinsic. Uh, you will will tell us more next. Uh, so, but your background uh, is uh, so management, engineering. It's uh, a good uh, background that can emerge just from technical point of view, but not only, also for business point of view. I guess that engineers uh, sometimes uh, know in terms of technical, but don't know in terms of business, maybe. Uh, so you have a long uh, career. So just a long step back when you attended your university, uh, business from Dennis, uh, engineering from 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 Robe. So what 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 were your favorite subjects during your university? And maybe Rob, you did uh, you hold a PhD? Mm, yes, tell me correct. also which was your topic. Okay, well, um, I do have a PhD in electrical engineering, and so it should be no surprise that my favorite subjects in high school and university were math and science. And so engineering was a logical uh, field for me to go into. Once I got into my, my bachelor's degree, I started taking semiconductor courses along with a lot of physics courses. And so I got very intrigued with how these devices work and how they are built and uh, wound up choosing to initially do my master's work in a gallium arsenide high-speed signal processing project and was geared up to do the PhD in the same area, but my professor left the university to privatize the technology and start his own company. So I was like, wait a minute, who's going to get my, well, wound up having to choose a different advisor for my PhD. And for that, I went into high-density plasmas. So I built a mercury vapor laser, a pulsed laser for my PhD thesis, and that got me into more of the high density plasma processing area. So I did a postdoc at the national lab on deposition and etch using high density plasmas that led to my first position at Motorola as a semiconductor manufacturer and then on from there. But that's kind of the, the background of what got me deeply into the technology. And along the way, I decided to take several courses in, in business administration and management just because I knew that the only way to fund and fuel technology projects is if they also have some business rationale behind them. And so I tried to tried to learn that piece as well. Thank you, Rob. And Dennis, tell us yeah. more about From you. From my standpoint, uh, we got to a similar place a different way. I was focused on business and marketing and economics during my time at the University of Arizona. I broke the chain of my brother being an engineer and my father thinking engineering was the only field. And then having said that, as I came out of school, I ended up working for Motorola, much like Rob. So over the years, I took my management, marketing and, and business acumen and worked my career through many very important companies in our industry focused uh, both on devices in the early going at Motorola and Fairchild, and uh, in the latter years, heavily involved in semiconductor equipment. And I've been through a lot of transitions that were important to the industry, and not the least of which is the one going on now with silicon carbide. So I uh, got to the same place, different ways. Uh, Rob is the brains in terms of technology, and he's got good business skills, and uh, I bring to the party lots of experience in management and executive leadership. So you you both have uh, experience in uh, marketing, uh, business, uh, engineering. Now you are working on uh, silicon carbide, silicon carbide industry. So um, 
that is a wide band gap uh, material. So uh, we so the benefits are very well known in industry. Um, has been known for for a long time. It's used like a semiconductor is uh, relatively recent. So how how is changing? So what uh, from academic to industry level and uh, so what are your expectations also also from extrinsic side? So tell me, Bob and then Dennis. Okay, from the standpoint of. Uh, you know, the silicon carbide, uh, Rob and I together, and I, I started in 2015 working with the material, have seen the interest go from a niche to a possible market developing. And in recent years, it's really caught fi fire with the uh, pressure from electric vehicles and many of the other applications to really fuel uh, tremendous demand versus a supply chain that doesn't follow the normal pattern of silicon. So uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Rob. Yeah, I think the that what's really changed is the end use drivers. So there have always been applications that silicon carbide or, or one of the other wide band gap materials would perform a little bit better than silicon, but now that difference is is highlighted in the electric vehicles and also in some of the power regulation areas where efficiency is paramount. The, the electric grid can only support so many uh, joules of energy per month, per year, and we've got to find a way to utilize that as efficiently as possible. Silicon carbide has caught the eye of the design teams as a way to get that 15, 20% improvement in efficiency. And so right now the industry, the silicon carbide industry is trying to catch up to the demand. And so that's what's fueling, fueling a lot of this. And that's what really changed, I think, from 15 or 20 years ago, where it's always had the same materials properties. It just didn't have that demand side pulling for the volume production. So Rob also will uh, will talk during uh, the Silicon Carbide panel uh, at the next Power Up, uh, mm -hmm. yes. 2020, 22 June. Looking looking forward to it. Thank you for uh, for your uh, for having you at uh, that panel next no next problem. June. So with Silicon Carbide, I mean also there will be a revolution in uh, in energy, a revolution in uh, automotive. So with electrification. Uh, so young people uh, uh, are coming uh, in uh, in the market for for the first uh, time. I mean, other people are understanding uh, which uh, subjects uh, for the university. I mean, so from your long experience, what are the suggestions for for young people, but also not only for students, but also for the people that are thinking to start. A new company, startup. I mean, in the wide band gap field. Probably. Dennis, do you want to comment on the business conditions there, or you want me to take the technology? Dennis, you take the technology because that also drives the business conditions. Okay, so from a technology standpoint, what what we're seeing is a a movement away from just you know sort of a single thrust in the industry which we which we used to call the moore's law node progression so the silicon industry and all the digital electronics followed a path that was very useful and and fairly easy to understand and it fueled a lot of companies and a lot of products but now what's happened is as the industry's matured and the technology has grown there's now the ability to fan out into more of these applications and use some of the process techniques and some of the methods in new ways. And I think that's where a lot of the excitement and a lot of the energy is going is it, whether it's silicon carbide or other materials, other types of devices like MEMS, nanosensors, all these kinds of things. You're seeing virtual reality headsets that have some fantastic technology built into them. And what is sometimes not obvious to the end users, is there's an enormous amount of, of engineering that goes behind each of those advanced products. And so my advice would be for anybody wanting to get into this field is first, you know, pick an engineering discipline that fascinates you, something that you're really intrigued by and you wanna learn more. And then keep your eyes open, 
learn, become a sponge, a knowledge sponge, and learn as many things as you can related to that field so that you can understand what's driving each set of decisions as the technology unfolds, because you're going to have to adapt. What I'm doing today is different than what I was doing 10 or 20 years ago. But you, if you stay open to that learning and adapt along the way, you got that solid foundation in engineering and materials science, and then you grow from there. Thank you, Rob. Dennis. Yes, from, yes for, for young people. Yeah, for young people and over on the business side, <clears throat> I've always been a biased advocate for people to move into the areas of marketing and sales and business development. In this case, mm -hmm. it's a whole new ecosystem. So whatever you think you know, because you maybe have some familiarity with semiconductors, at some level you can throw out the window because this is a new crowd of companies. It's a new set of applications and there's a whole new network to get involved in. That said, it's a pioneering opportunity that's growing very fast. And so as a young person, I think, uh, as Rob said, be a sponge. But as you absorb uh, and then decide which areas you want to go into, opportunities will be almost limitless. During your career, what was your best talk ever? Or, I mean, a particular moment where you you felt uh, difficult because, I mean, or was the first one talk because uh, you were young? I mean, so, or, uh, so tell me some uh, particular moment during your career? Yeah, I think for me that moment is pretty clear and it's when I became the president of Metron Technology and took the helm there of a company that had been in business since the 70s that had a thousand employees in 17 different countries. So for me it was a big step from going from a marketing and selling executive type role to being the chief operating officer and those initial days and the initial guidance given to the company where we were able to take what existed that was good and drive to make it much better. And so for me, that was uh, a milestone that I'll savor and remember for a long time. Well, for me, um, you know, I've done a lot of presentations from audiences, you know, everywhere from 10 people to 600 or 800 people. Uh, I think my favorite one was actually Pretty early in my career, shortly after I left Motorola and was with uh, Rodell slash Roman Haas at the time, and I decided to give a talk on how to set up and design and build a applications lab or what you might call a pilot line. And what made it fun was at the very beginning, it was an invited talk, so I had about a half an hour, and I said, instead of holding all your questions for the end, let's do this interactive. And I had the the audience just raised their hand or shout out as I was presenting the slides if they had a question or they had a comment. And it wound up being a fun half hour interaction between me and the audience. And, and so that one is always kind of stuck in my mind. That was fun. Nice. So we are in conclusion. So weekend <laughs> is, uh, is coming. So tell me next holiday, next project, next books. So which, uh, which reading do you, do you prefer? Maybe with uh, some uh, some wine, the best one. Dennis. Well, that's an interesting one. I like to escape, so uh, a novel that's uh, pure fiction, some of the uh, classics uh, would be the most stimulating to me, to get some rest and relaxation and to wind down. But which wine, Dennis? Ah, well, I'm going to go in a departure that's dangerous, but my favorite is Silver Oak. <laughs> Silver Oak Cabernet, I must say. That is my wife and mine, our favorite. All right. And, and for me, um, I do so much reading and stare at a screen so much through the, the normal business week that what I like to do on the weekends is either go hiking with my wife or sit sit in, uh, in the house with some smooth jazz um, in the background. Um, and for a favorite wine, um, I'm also going to probably disappoint you. Uh, it's actually from Alipay Cellars out in Avila Beach, California, and they have a, uh, a, a custom wine called the Rebecca. It's fantastic. Nice red wine. Thank you, everyone. It's been a pleasure to have you. It is uh, you. 
point down right. front. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Take bye care. Bye bye. bye, -bye.